get through after the uh, closing prayer. Parents, if you would pick your kids up down in the chapel. Up in the chapel. That's north. Up in the chapel. All right. James chapter 4. I read about an old preacher who went bear hunting in the Black Hills of South Dakota early one morning. And he hunted all day, didn't see a thing. Um, but he decided somewhere around 4.30, 5 o'clock, he better head back to his vehicle before it got dark. You can't hunt after dark. And uh, so he was heading back, and guess what? He got turned around. He got lost. He didn't know how to get out of there. And uh, so it got darker and darker and later and later. And he didn't know what to do except maybe fire his high-powered rifle in the air and hopefully somebody would hear him and that's what he did he fired several rounds in the air and sure enough somebody heard him it was the game warden and he showed up and said sir you're under arrest for hunting after dark that's against the law and he said I wasn't hunting I really wasn't um, I was lost and turned around and I just needed some help and that's the only thing I could think of to get somebody to come and help me. He said, yeah, well, the game warden said, I've heard that before. He said, well, I'm telling you the truth. Matter of fact, I am a pastor. I'm a preacher. And uh, he said, I I'm just asking you to believe me because it would be very embarrassing to me and my church and everything else. And I, I'm telling you, I was not hunting. So I'm asking you to help me here. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. If you really are a preacher, that means you know the Bible. And uh, I'll give you one, one chance. If you can recite the Lord's Prayer, then uh, maybe I'll just give you a warning this time. And boy, the, the old preacher was relieved. He was just so happy. But he did like I do so oftentimes. He went blank. Couldn't think. And then it was embarrassing, so he decided he better... He better he better recite something. So he recited the only prayer that he could think of. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And the game warden looked at him and said, Well, I guess you really are a preacher, so I'm going to let you off with a warning this time. We are, uh, we're talking about prayer this morning. Prayer is uh, one of the very greatest privileges that we have. Did you know that? And it's probably something we, we neglect about as much as anything else, but what a privilege it is to, to pray. It is uh, it's not only a way to get our needs met and, and even desires of our heart met. Did you know that it is fellowship with God? It's a way of having fellowship with Almighty God. What a, what a joy, what a privilege it is to pray. I want to bring a message this uh, morning entitled Fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. You have an outline on the back of your bulletin, and I encourage you to follow along, fill in the blanks to help you, and we may give you some other scriptures as well to write down. But right now, James chapter 4, if you would stand as I read God's Word this morning, James chapter 4. I hope and trust you have a Bible with you. James 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill, desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive, and ye, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your 
laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Father, we just turn the rest of this service over to you. Turn the rest of this day over to you. We ask for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet spirit that we feel today as we praise you and worship you. Now help us to focus on your word and help us to apply it to our life. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. One day the disciples came to Jesus and they had a request. And you know, if you really think about it, it's amazing because what would they, what would, if, if they're going to get one thing they can request from God, what would it be? Well, they didn't ask, Lord, would you teach us the secret of walking on water? I mean, that was so cool. They didn't ask that. They didn't say, God, would you, uh, would you teach us how to heal people? Because you've healed so many, and that, it helps lives. Would you teach us that? They didn't ask for that. Or, Lord, would you teach us to raise the dead? Would you teach us, Lord, to, to, to take just a little bit of food and multiply it so we could feed many people? They didn't request that. The request was, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, why would that be their main concern? Why would they? And I've, I've thought about that, and, and here's one of the reasons. I believe it's because they saw in the life of Jesus someone who prayed and prayed and prayed, prayed publicly, prayed privately. Uh, he would pray before important decisions. He would pray to do the Father's will. He would pray um, before healing someone after healing someone before he ate he would pray he would draw aside to pray for time periods of time and then he taught much on prayer so they saw a life in Jesus who was just saturated immersed in prayer and they knew the power that he had they knew the love that he had they knew the wisdom that he had so that must be the secret so they, they asked, they requested, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, of all the things we can learn to do in this life, perhaps the most important is to learn to pray. Everything in our personal life, our corporate life, our relationships, our effectiveness, our witnessing, and on and on, it hinges on our ability to get in touch with God, to pray. It's, it's, it's paramount. It's a, uh, the Bible says in James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So if we want needs met and, and desires of our heart, we need to learn to pray. So I want to share with you seven things and, uh, about prayer. And the first one is this. We must pray. We must pray. And before you think, well, duh, look at verse 2. You see this phrase, you have not, because what? Because you ask not. You don't pray. There's many things God just not going to do. You have not because you ask not. We live in a culture where people will fight and war and hate and plot and scheme and lie and cheat and deceive and on and on and on and on to get what they want. But for the Christian. He invites us to pray. Matter of fact, he commands it. But I like to think more of the, the invitation to pray. How awesome it is. What a privilege it is. Sometimes as Christians, we operate in the realm of our own energy, our own power to try to get what we want. And if all else fails, we then we might pray. And how foolish that is. It's prayer that links you to the power of omnipotent God. It's prayer. That's the key. To, to tap into the omnipotent God and all of his power. There was a little boy who was trying to move a, a big stone, just a little toddler. And he was working and he was pushing and he was straining and his dad was watching. And then he came over to the side and he just one time he budged it a little and then he'd go around the other side and he was training and he couldn't move it and his dad said are you doing everything you can to move it he said yes sir he said I don't think so 
because you, has, you haven't asked for my help. And that's, that's exactly what we do sometimes as Christians. We do everything we can. And, and, and we throw something else in there. We throw worry in there. And, and anxiety. And we're anxious. And on and on. Instead of taking it to the Lord in prayer. We must pray. I'm giving you seven of these. But I hope you'll think and meditate on them a little bit later. But let me go to number two. We must pray. Here's another one. We must continue to pray. We must continue to pray. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Did you know that prayerlessness is a sin? Sometimes I think we think of a prayer as something that's sort of optional. You know, okay, if I pray, I, can, I come out better. I know that it's a good thing to do. No, prayerlessness is a sin. It's a sin if we don't pray it's so important to pray and then to continue to pray and continue to pray so much so that the Lord Jesus gave a parable about the importunate friend you remember the story in Luke chapter 11 and the, the man comes at night and starts knocking and pounding on the door and said I need some food he said no 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 doors are all locked my family's all in bed not tonight but he keeps on keeps on asking keeps on knocking keeps on requesting he says look listen I've got some friends that have come in from out of town I need three loaves no we've gone to bed come back another time but he keeps on knocking he keeps on asking he said this is important and he just keeps on and Jesus said that he will get up and give him whatever he wants not because he's his friend but because he just keeps on asking, because of his persistence. Now, why did the Lord give us that? Is it so that I can go over there and just knock on Joshua's door and bug him to death till I get what I want? So we can just nag somebody, drive them crazy? No, it's so we'll go to the Lord and we'll continue to pray. We'll continue to ask. You know how I know that's the reason? Because right after that, the next two verses, he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. But did you know the tense of those three verbs are ask, and 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 ask. I could do this all day. And, and then seek and seek and knock and knock and knock and keep on and I hope you're getting it because sometimes we'll pray about something one time just for a minute and that's it and boy we don't well I prayed about it that, that's not real prayer he said to ask but he said to keep on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking and I believe that's one reason we don't have a lot of our prayers answered because you know sometimes if something's really important to us you got some loved one that's really in a bad strait, you know, something bad going on. Guess what you do? You ask and ask and ask and ask. Am I right? You got a soul that you're real concerned about because they're lost. What do you do? You're going to ask and ask and ask and ask. But so many things, we just throw a prayer out there and that's it. Folks, if we want God to answer our prayers, we've got to keep on asking. Number three. We must avoid foolish praying. Foolish praying. Now, what is foolish praying? That's when we pray with the wrong motives. That's when we pray selfishly. Um, look at verse 3. You ask and receive not. Here it is. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses. I'm coming back to this one. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Foolish praying is praying without regard of what, to what God wants. It's just being concerned with what I want. Listen, God's not going to answer that prayer. He's not going to bless that. I'm praying selfishly. I'm praying with the wrong motives. I'm praying for the wrong reasons. God's not going to bless that. He's not going to answer that. Number four. We must confess and repent of sin. Go to verse 8. You see this phrase, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify.
purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Listen, God loves you. He desires to answer your prayers. All right? That's a fact. But if we're holding on to sin, if, if I say I'm a Christian, but I've got sin in my life, maybe nobody even knows about it, but I've got sin in my life, listen to me, God is not going to hear my prayers. The Bible says in Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity, that's sin, in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I don't know how it could be clearer. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I'm holding on to sin, I want you to picture this, this, uh, this, this scene, this illustration. A man and a wife love each other. They get married. And, uh, and everything goes fine for, oh, let's say three or four years. They love each other. They give their love to each other, and everything's fine. But all of a sudden, this, this wife leaves her husband. And she moves in with another man. And she gives her love to him and her devotion to him. And her husband is over there and she's left her husband. But she goes back to her husband every now and then and says, Hey, you need to help us. We need some money. You need to help us. Or she, she comes back and she says, Hey, We've got two appliances that are down, and you know how to fix them. You come help us. Yeah, right. Listen, that's how it is. It's foolish for us to go to God in prayer when we are uh, harboring a sin in our heart. If you don't believe it, why do you think he said, ye adulterers? You see it there in verse three, uh, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God, I'm not committing adultery. You say, well, I, I mean, I do some things that are not right, and I know I've done, but I'm, I, I'm not committing adultery. Not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, if you're holding on to sin in your life and you're harboring sin, you're an adulterer or an adulteress. I am, you are, whoever's holding on to sin. You know what? You've committed not a physical adultery. You've committed spiritual adultery. Because you're saying, God, I'm all in for you. You're my Savior. You're my Lord. I belong to you. Everything I have, every, everything I am is yours. And then, but you're lying. No, you would be, you would be committing adultery, spiritual adultery adultery and he won't hear us you see because when we got saved we became the bride of Christ and when we're unfaithful to God we become adulterers I know that sounds that sounds harsh but that's what he's saying here committing spiritual adultery and you know what happens fellowship is broken fellowship is broken one of the main purposes of prayer is fellowship with God fellowship how neat it is to be able to just be with the Lord and fellowship with God I enjoy fellowships we're going to have a little fellowship this afternoon but we're talking fellowship with God how awesome is that but you see if I've got if you've got sin in your life or if I've got sin in my life I've broken fellowship doesn't mean I'm lost by the way that doesn't mean I'm lost I could break fellowship with my mom or my dad but I'm still their child right that doesn't change but I can break fellowship to where oh I've heard people say I hadn't talked to my mom in a long time we, we don't we don't get along we, we don't have anything to do with each other that's sad by the way don't do that by the way Life's too short, by the way. But that's what happens. We break fellowship with God. So what do we do? If we've got sin in our life, we confess it, repent, turn away from it. All right, move on. Number five. We must pray in the spirit of humility. We 
must pray in the spirit of humility. Look at verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, now I want you to underline this if you mark in your Bible, God resisteth the proud. But giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You see, we've got a real problem when we think we're all that. When we think we're tough, when we think we're smart, when we think we're so powerful, we've got a problem, folks. You know why? Because God resisteth the proud. When we become prideful and arrogant, God resists us. You know what that means? We're talking about prayer. It means he won't hear you. He's not going to hear you. You start strutting around and taking taking credit and glory for everything, he's not going to hear you. The Bible's clear with that. He resisted the proud. He gave it grace to the humble. So we've got to make sure that we're not, we're not uh, uh, lifting ourselves up. The Bible says in Luke 14, 11, Whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Humble. But he that humbleth himself shall be, what? Exalted. That's what the Lord says. Somebody wrote this, humility is the path to promotion in the kingdom of God. Isn't that good? I, I believe that. Humility. Humility. It's a key. You want to get close to God? You want to be more like Jesus? Humility is the key to promotion in the kingdom of God. You want to get promoted in the kingdom of God? Humility. I've been fortunate to be around some great men of God from time to time, certainly listen to some and and one of the characteristics I see is they, they're humble. They don't strut around like they, they, if they do, they've got a problem. Because they're doing a lot in the flesh. But we realize if we get closer and closer to the Lord, how important it is to have a humble spirit. We must pray in the spirit of humility. Number six, we must pray in faith. Claiming God's promises. The Bible says in Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And then James gives an example. Here's an example. If any man lack wisdom, okay, there's your example. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. And then it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven of the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So we must pray in faith, believing. I want to share a story I shared with it one other time. I don't know when, a long time ago, but it's tremendous. Small congregation in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains built a new sanctuary on a piece of land. Someone had willed, it, willed the land to them. And they had just completed their building. And uh, the building inspector came for the final inspection. Oh, they're excited. They're just a week or two weeks out from moving in, and they've already announced all that. The building inspector comes and says, you will not be able to move in until you add parking spaces got to add some more parking spaces well here's the problem they were landlocked there just wasn't a way there they had a mountain on one side they had a freeway on the other side and and uh, there's just no space zero so the preacher called a prayer meeting special prayer meeting and 24 people in the little congregation showed up and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed they got serious with God God, you permitted it. You gave us the land. You've allowed us to build the building. We're asking you to do a miracle and, and help us to be able to move in. Didn't know how, but when they finished praying, the preacher announced, we will move in on time, as scheduled. We will move in. This is, that was a Sunday. That was a Sunday evening. On Monday morning, a foreman of a construction company from another county showed up at the church and requested to, to talk to the preacher and he 
told the preacher, he said, we are building a huge pro project over in another county, and we are in desperate need of some fill dirt. And we're, I'm just going to put it out here. Would you let us have part of the, this mountain here that backs up to your land? We'll pay you for it. And not only will we pay you, but if you want us to, we will pave it and we will add more parking for you. That's on a Monday morning. We'll pay you for it and we'll build it. And they moved in as scheduled. Those 24 people had a mountain-moving prayer answered. God promised to do that. God can move a mountain. He can do anything. Some people's God's just not big enough. My God can do anything. There's nothing that's off limits for him. He's the one that created this world in the first place. God can handle it. But you've got to pray in faith. Does that mean God always answers our prayers? Let me give you one more story. There was a preacher by the name of Jim Conway, a pastor. And he found out that his daughter, Becky, had, a, had cancer. And they were going to have to amputate her leg. Well, Pastor Conway started praying. His family started praying. Uh, the church started praying. And they prayed in faith, believing God would take the cancer away. She would not have to have her leg amputated. So much so, they had enough faith that, that Pastor Conway, when it came time, the day of the surgery, he said, he said, would you run the test one more time before you do the surgery? And he was sure. He knew God's going to, the cancer's going to be gone. They ran the test. Cancer was there. They had to amputate her leg to save her life. See, sometimes our prayers aren't answered the way that we're praying, which brings me to the number seven. We must trust God for the answers. By the way, let me... Let me just mention one thing that Brother Clement mentioned Wednesday night, and some of you weren't here. Brother Clement Wynn was diagnosed with cancer three and a half years ago, and they told him if he did not start chemo immediately to help prolong his life, he has maybe two weeks, two weeks to live. He did not start chemo made some changes in diet and prayed and we prayed and three and a half years later he just got back and they said there's no sign of cancer in his DNA isn't that amazing we give God all the glory for that no sign of cancer he just got this report that's three and a half years ago God is still in the miracle business are we still in the business of praying is the question well, what happened? So this, this Becky had to have her leg amputated, and this devastated Pastor Jim Conway. And it drove him back to the Lord, back to Scripture, back to prayer. Oh, God, I don't understand. Have you ever been there? I don't understand. We believed you would, we would, he would heal her. Here's what he got. Here's what he learned. Here's what God gave him. I want you to write this down, by the way. Please write this down. Because you may be facing something like this. You may wonder why God hasn't answered a, a particular prayer that you prayed in faith. And you, every, from everything you know, it's the right way to pray. But here's what he learned from prayer and scriptures. Here's what he got. Faith does not insist on a certain outcome. Faith does not insist on a certain outcome. I have heard people, and I'm sure they mean well, but they find a promise in God's Word and they start barking orders to God. They start telling God what He has to do. 
And he don't have a choice because I'm quoting scripture. Folks, that's not, that's not right. You don't tell God what to do. <laughs> you may think you have, uh, you, you may think you know what's right and what's best, and you may pray in faith, and, and, and you might find a promise in God's word, but you can't tell God what to do. Faith does not insist on a certain outcome. And by the way, one, one reason I know that people do that is because I've heard t uh, television evangelists do that. They, they've, they've said, you just pray this, and God, he didn't have a choice. Folks, you, that's, so, that's so ridiculous. You don't understand who's omnipotent and who is sovereign here. It's not you. It's not me. It's God. So what do we do? We keep praying. We keep trusting. We must pray. We must keep on praying. We must avoid foolish praying. We must confess and repent if there's any sin in our life. We must have the spirit of humility. We must have faith. But we must trust God for the answers. We must trust God for the answers. I hope you won't let this message just go away quickly. I hope you'll go back through it. As a matter of fact, it might be a good idea if we just sort of reviewed it every day so that we'll learn to pray like we've never learned to pray. I, I don't believe any of us have tapped into prayer the way God wants us to, the way the Lord Jesus had. And let me just say this. You must, if you want, your, you want prayers answered, the first prerequisite, I didn't, I didn't say this, but it's true. You must be saved. You must be saved. If you want God to hear and answer your prayers, you've got to be one of his children. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, we'll give you an opportunity to be saved today. Or if you need to make another decision, or if you want me to pray with you, I'll be here at the front. Maybe you just want to come and pray at the altar. Whatever you need to do, want to do for the Lord, just be obedient. Let's all stand. and We'll have... An invitation, Father, we just pray that we would learn to pray and that we'd be faithful to pray, that we'd have the right spirit when we pray. Lord, I just ask that you would move our hearts. Help us not to be able to get away from this message, but Lord, that we would just be serious in prayer. Teach us, Lord, teach us to pray if there's any decisions need to be made Lord help us to make them even now in Jesus name Amen